Hello, everyone, uh, and all the fantastic readers who will be watching this uh, later on. Uh, this is uh, S.D. Howard or Stephen Howard, and then I have uh, my famous author friend, uh, Melissa Little, the author of The Book of Secrets. And uh, we're going to be doing a fun uh, new setup that uh, Melissa has come up with. And I'm super excited to kind of go over it uh, and put it to the test. So she's going to be answer. Uh, she's going to be asking me a set of questions, and then uh, I have to respond and come up with it on the fly. I do not know what any of these questions are beforehand, and then I get to do the same to her, and that's how it's going to roll. So I'm super excited uh, to do this. So uh, Melissa, fire away! I am ready. Okay, I am back with yet another idea I've made up. Um. The first question for this, this question stemmed because in the last negative review of my book on Goodreads, somebody said there were no naming conventions in this world. The characters were just named whatever. So my question for you is, did you have naming conventions to give your characters names you just liked? Uh, so I'm gonna move to my doorway because my internet's true. Okay. No worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so did I have any naming conventions for my world? Or did you just world? give them names that you liked? Um, so I had a rough idea. Um, because I've been, so I've been building this world for, um, a total of about 14 years or so. Mm -hmm. And so when I first started off, it was very much, um, and and the 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 lands that we get to in by trilogy three um that's where i initially started writing this whole thing and so i kind of had like at the time um romano britain uh influences and then i had like norse influences and then i had like um uh Medo-Persia influences um, for Carwith, Delwar, and Parthia um, in that order. And so in this one, I wanted to do more um, heavily Celtic, Scottish, Irish uh, themes. And so um, a lot of the names like Cadran, it actually means battle king. Mm -hmm. um in i think it was uh irish so i used a lot of um uh, the the bob on sea which um ulcia is queen of that is a uh monster from like irish folklore so i pulled mm -hmm. some very heavy influences from there and i tried to keep the naming conventions somewhat similar in that sense now exfos is its own it, it's its own thing it was just exfos sounds cool so i'm going with exfos but it's got like um and and we actually get to see more of this in book two uh more like italian type culture so it's not mm -hmm. it's not heavily like just transposing it there's going to be elements of that um and then thaidu is actually more mongolian influence like they're they're a ho people of the horse um so but the naming conventions probably aren't going to sound heavily mongolian like yeah. uh the people <laughs> the people down in expos not gonna sound heavily italian um mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I, I do have general themes that I like to try and stick to, especially if the names have meaning, I try and do that. Like, um, with Jaden's name, uh, not to spoil it for anybody, but Jaden isn't his real name. Uh, his real name actually means what it says it means later on in, in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and which who knew? So, Yeah. So All right, did, and I, there you go. Did did you have any naming conventions that you were 
using, even though the the person, the reviewer says that you know, there wasn't. So contrary to the reviewer, I actually had really tight naming conventions. She just didn't pick up on them. So everybody in the Southern half of the country, they have like, I did a lot of nature based names. Um, and the exception are like three of the kids in the Draven family, they don't have nature based names, which is intentional. And it's even explained in the book. Um, and then as you go north, um, the names like, I gave people a lot of names like based on some last names that I knew. And then, for example, with Winter and Elowen, I knew somebody who had little sisters named Winter and Elowen, so I used those names. And um, the, it was just kind of like more, I guess, I don't want to say elite, that doesn't make sense, but like just, I guess, fancier names. Um, and then, so I, so I actually did have a system that I was following. Nice. I like it. All right. So now your turn. Okay. Um, so where is your world set now? And to, to, and to clarify that, cause like when, when I was reading, I can't quite pick up on like, cause there there's, there's different themes. Like I remember when we were doing our last video, like I caught ambulance and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> it threw me off so like where like where what's the what's the setting for like, your can world you, can you say can uh, the last thing i heard was ambulance and you froze a little bit uh oh um like what's the setting for your world like, like the I'm time period yeah yeah time period okay. like all all that kind of stuff because that was something that i was super interested in and intrigued people, by when i was reading so many people hate this oh my gosh if you go on goodreads and like scroll down oh people lose their minds over this <laughs> um so because people want convention and i don't provide it and they feel uncomfortable um so okay it all started out i was like when it started in 2016 it was all very tidy. Um, it was like very, I don't say medieval, it was never medieval, but um, it had medieval influences. There was like not a lot of technology. Um, the clothing and the lifestyles were not medieval because I've just never been that into it because I mean, everybody dies and I mean, you know, like the slightest thing kills you. You know, That's I didn't true. want that. Um, <laughs> But it was just very, um, like, not, um, not a lot of technology. But then book two, I couldn't make, I could not make it work without radios. Like, there was absolutely no way. And so all of a sudden, there was just a radio there. And I'm like, wait a minute, what, why is there a radio? And uh, I was like, well, just forget it. I'll, I'll work that out later. And, um like it literally would not work without a radio. I had to have a radio. And um, and so then I was like, well, maybe maybe this timeline isn't working with the way the story's going. Um, and so then in book three, all of a sudden there's like a more modern, as it got into like an actual war in book three, it was not, I mean, they still had swords, they're still on horses, but then all of a sudden there's like, there's um, like air air warfare. And I was like, and I couldn't make it work without that. And so I, I was like, well, clearly I need to rework this, but I'm just going to write book three as if the other two books don't exist mm -hmm. and I'll just work it out later. So I wrote book three kind of on a different timeline. And so then when I went back and rewrote book one, um, I was just, I sort of like, I'm like, well, I just, I'm just going to dump whatever I want in here. And, I'll, and so uh, people can't stand it but I kind of worked it out that like at one point they were somewhat on a timeline long. like I kind of call it like no punk um but it's like it's kind of like let's say they were like up to the 50s and then there was the war and it set them back um because they uh they're they lost for one thing they lost oil and they they had run a lot on oil 
So then they had to turn to electricity, but I started reading about what would it take for all of your vehicles and everything to be powered by electricity. And it's even the US grid can't sustain that. So I was like, well, even their grid can't. So they have no way to support all these vehicles anymore. Um, so I, I started coming up with like these very, you know, if you use your imagination, it kind of works. Um, but basically it's just a hodgepodge of whatever I want in there. It doesn't make a ton of sense, but like I, I kind of have a reason for why it's that way. And some people were like, oh, this is amazing. A bunch of people hate it. And they're like, what the heck? This doesn't make any sense. Well, it kind of, it, it strikes me as um, like, cause like when I was, when I was reading that uh, the, the first few chapters and stuff, I was trying to pinpoint where I was, where I was at. Cause I, I, I hadn't read your book beforehand and I hadn't seen anything on Wattpad. So I didn't know what it was that you were uh, even writing as a genre. And it struck me as kind of almost this like um, steampunk meets fantasy feel, you know, to, in yeah. a very broad sense. Um, yeah, it's not quite steampunk because it's more advanced than steampunk. So there's also something called diesel punk where it's like the Cold War. Okay. And uh, so I would pinpoint it there. It's not quite the punk genre, but technologically it's right about there. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. And uh, yeah, but people don't like it, but it's, it's set in the year 2015. Oh, whoa. They run, their timeline is parallel to ours. Oh, okay, gotcha. So it's set in the year 2015. They're just technologically behind us. Gotcha. Okay. Nice. There we go. Okay, so my question for you is, what character would be hardest for you to kill? Ooh. Ooh. There's the, so there's the character that my readers would kill me for killing. Uh, <laughs> but I think the, the, the hardest person that, oh man, that one is tough. Uh, Cause it, it's kind of split between um, Udar and Batani in the book um i guessed i guess batani for you yeah i i just i love batani so much mm -hmm. she's just the best um she would have i would have a very very hard time killing batani off um which is why unless the just it goes just sideways um she was like probably the one of the more likely ones to make it through the, this entire trilogy um i i have already planned out a character death for one of the characters one of the main ones uh -huh. um so i i have been planning that out um with all of the angsty emotional feels um but yeah i think batani would probably be and actually uh i can't i can't really say udar because i already have um i already have his death planned out um, oh really yeah i've i've in actually trilogy. had trilogy not in this trilogy okay but like a like a an extra scene like later in life yeah it, it'll be okay. it'll be much much later into the the entire series of books that he dies okay um okay at least at this point well at uh, least he got to live a long life oh yeah he's hopefully. gonna live a really long life <laughs> but yeah okay. uh that's good but, yeah so i already had i technically already have his death planned out i already I, i've started planning another character's death so it's going to be leading up to that um everybody else is kind of expendable at this point but batani is probably the one where i just wouldn't be able to do, bring myself to do it <laughs> They're expendable. <laughs> See, yeah. that's so funny. Because that brings you to asking me the question. I'm like, I'm the same way. I kind of view everybody as expendable. Like, it's really awful because, especially because I write about literal children, like they're minors. <laughs> but it's like, you're all expendable to me. <laughs> like, just like, throw them away. 
just keep throwing bodies at the problem. I'm like, it's not hard for me. Some people are like, oh, it was so hard for me to kill this character. And I can't do that. And I've always felt so bad. Because <laughs> I don't have a hard time. I'm just like, oh yeah, I just like just like chopped them off. Like I had no problem. But um, well, see, like, I will it, say. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say like in my, in uh, my Lord of the Rings fan fiction, like everyone has a target on their back. Absolutely everybody. <laughs> I mean, I'm killing off people left and right and everyone's just going why you monster <laughs> oh in my third book my beta readers honestly told me i had to tone it down they're like this is gratuitous <laughs> and so i honestly cut some <laughs> and i was like okay okay they're like people who read the first book did not sign up for this and i'm like okay that's fair like <laughs> um but um Oh, there is one character. I'm just gonna say this. There's a char- there are a lot, there's also a lot of characters, like there's a lot who die, and there are a lot believed to be dead who are not dead. And I'm just gonna say one of the ones believed to be dead is one who I could not kill off. I'm just gonna say that. There was one I couldn't kill off. I'll just nice. say that. For all the people who are reading the uh the books uh either now or in the future, they're gonna be like wait like their their room is gonna look like uh like it's gonna be like red strings and post-it notes trying to like put all of it together to figure out who it is well if once they read the third book i'll tell them (laughs) well that's true but uh, but until they get there they're gonna have like their conspiracy wall behind them being like oh and that the person who's believed to be dead but i ultimately could never kill was actually supposed to die it just That's the, but the only reason they the only reason they didn't die was not because I ultimately couldn't it's just because it didn't work for the story I mean I probably could have found it in me eventually to kill them you just gotta muster up the courage to <laughs> off with his head stab him yeah exactly oh, um okay so uh what were the biggest influences on your writing leading up to writing your book i do know the answer to this okay so when i was little it started out when i was little um i i had i was like a chameleon writer i would just copy whatever author i had just read i had no style of my own and then it was the author it's, her name's Patricia Riley Giff. She's just a middle grade author, but she was like really good at description. And I read a bunch of her books when I was like 13. And um, I learned how to better describe because my just I basically had no descriptive writing before that point. It was like, just, it was just, it was all dialogue. Um, mm. And so from that, I learned how to describe. And then, um, so that was when I was like 13. And that's, the rest of my life so it started getting better then um and then Marcus Zuzak in high school because he's described so differently and it taught me how to like think outside the box and describe things um and then what made me want to write fantasy in the first I was reading the once and future king and I was really enjoying the descriptions of the castle and I wanted to write a story set in a castle and so that was why I started writing mine. Of course, that was the first draft, which, and it took place a lot more in the castle than the than the one now does, because it doesn't even resemble what ultimately got published. It's a completely different story. But that was why I started writing, because before that, I'd never writ- written fantasy. Um, and then a lot of people say it's like Wingfeather Saga, but I read that after I wrote mine, so that any similarities there are actually coincidental Hmm. so that was not an influence but it is similar and I do enjoy it so what are your influences so the you know I I actually used to hate writing um I, I despised it with every fiber of my being and um but i loved reading 
and uh, mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien um, were very big parts of my life uh, growing up in you know middle school, high school. Um, and as I started reading more, uh, I think I was introduced to Stephen R. Lawhead when I was 16, and he writes more um, Arthurian legends, Celtic fantasy uh, style books. I have some of his books um, over here. He's written a Robin Hood mm-hmm. retelling, which made me want to like go out, chop down a tree and make my own longbow because uh, it was just so amazing. Um <clears throat> And Frank Herbert's Dune with all of its political machinations. Um, So I've had a lot of influences in terms of like big breathtaking worlds. Um, And then when it comes to like just something that I can binge, Ted Decker's books, um, which are uh, some of a lot of his are, you know, Christian like psychological thrillers um that will just make your skin just be like uh he's got some christian fantasy i mean it's not labeled christian fantasy but that's what i would call it um that is is absolutely fantastic and so you know as i was writing i did i did very similar uh things as uh you were doing you know i I was very dialogue heavy um my first uh, my very first plot that I ever came up with, like, is described on one page where I like extended the margins to f- completely fit. And then it's just all one single running paragraph. Like it is it is an eyesore, but I kept it. Um, and I still have the original draft. Uh, I called it a, a Narnian tale. Uh, it was my fan fiction. <laughs> Um, but I started off writing fan fiction, uh, because Mm -hmm. it was an easy way to kind of get into writing once I really kind of fell in love with it. And so Lord of the Rings, um, was obviously very heavily, heavily influential, influential in like the scope of world building, the lore that Tolkien created. I wanted to have that type of setting in mind. Um, you know, I did a lot of copying, um, and then I was like, I'm trying to, hard to be Tolkien and not Mm -hmm. enough of just trying to be me and what I like to write and where I found my niche was actually writing YA and I didn't know that's what I was good at doing until I got on Wattpad and I was posting my fan fiction stuff and then that was predominantly the audience that I was reaching yeah everyone loved it and it was all the angsty feels and I was just like I found my calling (laughs) and uh, you know, that's, that's what eventually led to uh, the city of snow and stars. But I mean, it started with the, my very first trilogy, um, which will become uh, it'll actually start in the next trilogy and then Mm -hmm. it'll continue for the last two trilogies. So that'll be uh, a fun time once I've actually moved past finishing this one up. <laughs> yes. But yeah, those, those are exactly. some of the big, the big heavy hitters in, in uh, that were huge influences in uh, my writing. Yes. All right. So my question is what scene affected you the most while you were writing it? Oh yeah. I don't even have to think about that. Chapter 23. Uh, I, I can't give spoilers, um, for those who are watching, chapter, um, Go ahead. Uh, chapter 23 is in Kiax and, uh, in, what? in Kiax and that scene was the, the, the heaviest emotionally for me. Um, and without getting into, uh, too many spoilers, um, that is oh, where a yeah. lot, yeah. <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is where my content warning is applied. <laughs> um, that was the most emotionally heavy chapter that I probably have ever written. Um, and it pulls 
a lot from my own experiences with uh, sexual abuse and the things that I remember and having to to navigate that because uh, I, I I had shared draft two's version um, with three betas of mine and uh, it it wasn't done well in draft two and I knew that and I knew I was going to have to do some pretty big revisions on it but getting the feedback um, from these three ladies was um, absolutely crucial um, because it actually moved the the scene from post Kiax to during Kiax. And mm -hmm. that wasn't something that I had thought about before. And it totally made sense why it didn't make sense after the fact. And so, and they were like, we need to be there with her when it happens. And I was like, shoot. <laughs> Cause there was a reason why I had uh, that's understandable though. Like instead of cutting after it happens, cause that's so jarring. Yeah. Yep. And that's exactly what they said. And so to, to be there and, and not go into uh, graphic detail, um, but to give, I mean, this is technically spoilers. So plug your ears, everybody, if you don't want to hear <laughs> whatever this is. Um, having to put Trinia through that was hard enough. Um, what was even harder you know, I'm just going to put a, I like, I'll, I'm going to go through, I'm going to edit this and I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a spoiler warning <laughs> before this one. Cause I don't think I can yeah, actually explain ahead. it no with, way. without doing this. Um, but when, so like Trinia rescuing Batani was something that absolutely happened in the second draft. Um, that part remained the same. However, they in draft two make it out, but in this one, she had to get caught. And as soon as I made it to where Batani was rendered ineffective um, because of the, the prison bars and uh, having to have Trinia drop the illusion and then step forward and forgetting, like as soon as she realizes and sees Batani the reader is just like, oh no. Cause you know mm -hmm. what's about to happen. And I knew what was about to happen. I knew the weight of what was about to happen as I was writing it. And I'm like, I don't want to do this because now I had unintended consequences where Batani is forced to watch this take place. And I was just like, I am a horrible person <laughs> for putting my characters through this. But then you try, then you also like, then you have Batani have to deal with it too. Yeah, yeah, and it's so it's it's this it's you know this unintended consequence and repercussions, and the, you know this deeply affects Batani, which we kind of get more into in book two. Um, and so yeah, I mean, it was it was incredibly difficult and a very emotionally weighty um, to write that chapter out. I mean, I, I had to be, I was just like, I have to step back from this. I have to be done writing for today. Cause like, as soon as that final uh, sentence, but no one heard her, I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I can't write. I has, I has no more of the words for today. I need to go find a corner and cry <laughs> or something like, yeah, that, that was by far the most emotionally charged for me personally because it brings up a lot of my history um with abuse to uh, and that's that's ultimately why i ended up putting the content warning um mm -hmm. at the beginning of the book was because like I, there's a lot of controversy or whether you put it in there and and i always tell people i'm like who are asking the question I'm like i put it in there because i've been through similar experiences and i know how emotionally um weighty it was for me having to write it so for a reader who's not expecting that i didn't want them to just stumble across chapter 23 and then be like oh shoot and then mm -hmm. they're thrown back and you know they're having you know a ptsd thing going on and so 
I, I don't specify where in the book it is when I gave the content warning, but it was more of just like a, this is the stuff that I'm talking about and we are going to hit on this at some point. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that for me was the most emotionally charged. Yes. How about for you? What was the, what was the scene that was just like, Oh, <laughs> okay. So I had two, only one has been, been published because the other one's in the third book so the first one is in the in book one i don't know what chapter it is because we all know how i am with remembering where my own stuff is <laughs> um uh it was when uh i don't know if you've read the whole book um but it's when gabriel goes in the mountain with he has the what does he have at this point he has the stone and he goes in the mount sorry i'm like adhd um i'm looking at something on my fish tank that needs to be fixed um he has okay so he has the stuff it's after um he's come back from the other realm and he has the stone and they he goes into the mountain and it's at that point where he's like before he can do anything he's forced to say his fears out loud instead of like because he spent the entire book just running and in this mountain there's like nowhere to go he has to say his fears out loud and in that book without meaning to i put a bunch of my um own fears into him because 2017 was like had been a really really bad year for me like i wasn't sleeping my ear i was having a, t a ton of panic attacks that year um it was just like because it had been bad for like I'd had a series of bad years but 2017 was just like a really bad one because it was before I got any kind of treatment um it like all came to a head in 2017 and I was writing that book in the summer of 2017 and so without even meaning to like I had never intended to I had just projected all of this onto Gabriel uh, which is weird because it's, it's like there's this 13 year old boy and then there's me I was like 21 and I just poured it into him, which was, you know, you, you wouldn't think of like that character is who I would pour it into, but I did. And so it was hard because as he sang all this, it wasn't all of mine, obviously, but it was like a bunch of mine. And it was, so it's like him saying it was me saying it and like admitting, you know, here that I can't do anything about it. Here's what, I, here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm fearing. I can't do anything about it. And it was just really hard for me to see it. And I write on paper and the, or at least I did back then. Um, and I actually was, had to like write it in the dark cause I didn't want to see it written. Um, so just like actually writing it but not seeing it was the only way I could do it. Um, so that was the hardest one for me too like cause having to face it. Mm. Um, and then the other one was um, in book three which was, um, it was just two scenes. It was actually like, one involved killing somebody. And then, um, which is like the majority of book three. And then another one was like the aftermath. And it was just unusual because usually I write in the, at night, but I wrote, I wrote both of them in the morning. And so because of that, it just, it kind of like felt me, it left me feeling really out of whack. And I was just kind of like really worn out after that because I, I had to put so much thought into it. But um, for the most part, I'd say the one that affected me most was in the first one. Yeah, yeah, no, I in I think that's something that a lot of people deal with, you know, like um, I have I didn't realize how much I struggled with anxiety until <laughs> last year. Um, and just and because you know with my uh, my background of abuse um and control being taken away from me at you know such a young age i have very deeply rooted control issues and mm -hmm. like i need to control everything and god in uh 2019 just just before everything with COVID happened was like you need to learn to trust me now and then in March, like I was having like these, um, uh, these heart issues where my heart would be racing and palpitating and feeling like it was going to burst out of my chest. 
And so I like ended up getting like a heart monitor on for two weeks. I mean, it was crazy. And like my anxiety was like through the roof that point. Like Mm -hmm. I had never experienced anxiety like I had that uh, in March. And like we we hadn't even really so many physical health problems. What's that? It gives you so many physical health problems. Oh yeah. Yeah, it, it messes up with your with your gut. It messes your sleep. Mm-hmm. It messes. I mean, um, I eventually went and got a. Um, uh, it's not a retainer. Um, like a mouth guard. So it's for grinding your teeth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's just you know it's just a little thing you boil for a few minutes, pop it in there, and yeah, it and just then molds, it molds to your teeth. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, my jaw stopped popping. My ears stopped ringing. <laughs> I mean, it was just like I was just clenching my teeth so hard at night and I didn't know until I got that and then I slept and I was just like it's a whole new world (laughs) it was amazing (laughs) yeah but yeah anxiety it it sucks and I I can absolutely relate with pouring out those things into characters Um, that's what I did with uh, all of my characters to a different uh, to different extents you know, Trinia was the abuse. Um, Udar is that question of why, like, why would you allow this horrible thing to happen? You know, in his relationship with God, Jaden running and not wanting, you know, running from responsibility and not wanting to to do it and, you know, having to actually make a, a good choice at some point. Like, yeah, I, I think, especially as authors, we all pour ourselves into the characters at one point or another because we have our own issues we have to deal with (laughs) yeah there's even a part when gabriel's like freaking out because the back of his head is hurting and he's like why would the back of my head be hurting and like i was constantly because i was constantly stressed i would get headaches in the back of my head and then i would freak out from that and i'd be like this isn't normal why is the back of my head hurting (laughs) yeah (laughs) so even that made it in there (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a good way to, um, like I, I was, I was telling like my clients and students and stuff. I'm like, the first draft is your cathartic writing to get out and just realize how messed up you are. And then you just go through and you refine it in the next couple of drafts and then it's much better. Um, all right, your turn and then we'll do the final round. Okay. Uh, so what is the scariest creature in your world? Um, none of the creatures, oh, well, never mind. I was going to say none of the creatures turn out to be scary. Like all the animals that they think are scary aren't because I like them. But actually, I invented the night hags. I'm not, I don't think they're scary. I think they're cool. But I guess some people think they're scary. I don't really know. But here's the funny thing. They're actually plague doctors. They're flying plague doctors. Because I saw them in my history book when I was in community college and I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing. And so I, and I was writing like the first draft at the time. And so I stuck them in there. And um, it's funny because now you see plague doctors everywhere. There's like stuffed animal plague doctors and like plague doctor costumes. This was way before, you know, nobody even knew what a plague doctor was. And so now the plague doctors are everywhere. You know, it's like a joke because like the plague. And uh, now I'm like, oh, look, there's night hags everywhere. Nice. But um, <laughs> but some people, uh, but night hags like you can't kill them because they're an illusion. There's really only like one of them, and the rest are just an illusion of that one. So you have to kill the leader, or else you can't kill them. So that makes them challenging because they're very bloodthirsty. Um, so I guess they're kind of scary, but I'm not. I'm not sure. I can't speak for that. I don't. You'd have to ask other people. What about nice. you? What's the scariest? uh the bob on sea by far um yeah because uh, they are they are based off of so like i wanted um banshee type creatures in it and uh when i was looking up different scottish folklore scottish and irish folklore one of the things that popped up was the bob on sea it sounds French to me, but it's, it's Irish. Um, 
and they are now the the actual creature itself is like um a blood sucking vampire slash temptress of the night and so while i do use and incorporate a lot of those elements in there they will be referred to as banshees um like in the book in several places um but they are the the scariest i think um because uh so like you know the there's no one above their temptations and mm -hmm. and that that's why i used them as an example and they always go for people's um either they they target the powerful because um they they hunger after more power or they go after the lonely and you know we see this with Jaden. um he mm -hmm. he said he expresses that that feeling of loneliness and then surprise surprise um <laughs> one shows up is like Hey, because I can't watch you follow me. And he's like, <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, like even, uh, again, spoilers, I'm giving a spoiler alert for those who don't want to hear this, plug your ears. La, 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 la. Um, if you're still watching this, you get spoilers. Um, even Cadron, who is very intelligent and um, incredibly manipulative himself still falls to Ulsia and um, comes under her, her power. And, you know, it's the, uh, it was the Ulsia uh, in particular. And there's, there's concepts that are, that I'm kind of playing around with in book two um that will go into a little bit more details of um the Baban C, at least some of um Ulsia's daughters. But Ulsia herself is the personification of lust in all its forms uh in the book, which is why, like for those who hunger for it, she's going to find them. And ultimately her promises end up empty, uh, as we see by you know the end of the book um for a lot of people <laughs> but yeah she is by far the scariest because um she's the only one who can rival udar out of everybody like not even kadrin could rival udar in power um no. it is only ulsia and that is what makes her so utterly terrifying because <laughs> udar is freaking powerful <laughs> All right, so my final question for you, I'm gonna combine questions four and five because this is taking a while. Um, the combined question is, which one of your own characters would you wanna spend a day with? And if you know the answer to this, which one of my characters would you wanna spend time with? Okay. Um, I think if I were to to pick, I'd want to hang out with Mandar. Because Mandar's just a bro. He is just the mm -hmm. broest of bros. And he's just got wisdom and insights. And like if I was going to get myself into trouble, I'd hang out with Batani. <laughs> but if I just want to like hang out and have like a nice relaxing day, I'm probably gonna go with Mandar. Um, it depends on your mood. Yeah, yeah, definitely depends on the mood. Um, you know, Jaden also finds himself getting into trouble, but um, I want to like Batani is more like the playful trouble. Jaden is just like making stupid decisions and getting himself into trouble. <laughs> so wouldn't want to go there. Um, no. And I uh, think Batani is more like fun trouble. Jaden's oh, like yeah. criminal trouble. Yes, yeah. Batani is like, let's troll Udar trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and then run away as quickly as we can. <laughs> that would yeah. be Batani's uh like best day is just to troll Udar all day. Mm -hmm. That would be her life. Um, but yeah, I would say Mandar. Um the I think the character from from your book that I uh 
loved right from the get-go and i'm i'm blanking on her name uh but it, it's the sister who's like super quiet and just like goes around shooting stuff and comes back with food that's ren ren that's right yes i love goes around shooting stuff that's hilarious yeah <laughs> that, that's what i remember is she's going around she's just shooting stuff and just bringing it home for food oh, that's that's accurate <laughs> well yeah i loved ren there was just something about her where i was just like I would totally love to hang out with you for a day. <laughs> a lot of people like her. Yeah, I get, I get, I can understand why. Like just that little bit, I'm just like she's mysterious. She's got sass, and I'm a sucker for both of those. So <laughs> there you go. Okay, so now you ask it back to me. Yeah. So who would you want to hang out with for a day of your own characters and? if you can think of one for uh, one of my characters. So I know instantly of yours, but um, for mine, um, I am not like a big conversationalist unless we have a topic. So I would say Hollis and Patch because I like to be around with kids. Um, I don't run out of things to do with them. We could have a, a good time together. And then with yours, this is easy. This is a spoiler alert for the end of the book. I would get together with Udar. I know I say his name wrong, but I can't get it right in my head. Udar or Udar and Trinia and make them talk to each other. <laughs> I would put the three of us in a room. I would say, hey, Udar, do you want to come spend time with me? And then, hey, Trinia, do you want to come spend time with me? And not tell them that they were both invited and then smash them together. Yeah, they, they do need a solid watch. talking to. They do. Yeah. Just say, work it out and smash them together. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that would satisfy me so much. That's all I want. Yeah. That I, I hope I will I be and will I be satisfied? Will I get what I want? Maybe at by book three. Oh my gosh. I, <laughs> maybe. We'll have that's to see. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff. Time. Like I've I've managed to outline about three quarters of book two. Uh, it was it's actually been taking a lot longer to f f like weave the pieces together than I was expecting, and um, and so I mean it's it's already looking very different than what i had or had been planning for before the end of book one uh well i, I would say by the end of book one because uh yeah. there was so much that happened in book one that influenced book two um but yeah it's it's going to be a very very interesting time uh writing out the second one because i think there's going to be some some surprises for everybody i know that the first the first 10 chapters is going to have the most epic um, plot twist that everyone is just going to, they're just going to lose their minds. And I'm going to revel in every angsty will moment. I, will I it. go feral again? You probably will. Because <laughs> there's, there's so much, much that happens. Feral. I don't go feral over movies, but I go feral over books a lot. Yeah, this, this will so probably, probably send feral. everybody uh send everybody Fail. over the edge in probably in all of the best ways um because this is one that i've been planning since the beginning of book two and or uh excuse me uh beginning of the the second draft i think it was and so like i i've known what i wanted to do i just wasn't sure how it was going to play out until i finished the this book but now that I've finished it, like I am stoked for uh, everybody getting, I think it's, I think it's, I think I have it at like chapter nine or chapter 10 okay. is when it, I'll when that it. plot bomb drops. All right. Well, this was a good first interview. I think you understand the format now. Yeah. So now I, I can shove you and Verity together for part two. Yes. Yes. I'm super I've done excited my duty. about that. <laughs> done the duty now we move forward with you and verity shoved together All yeah right. yeah that's gonna be fun round. absolutely so round and thank you 
thank you everybody for uh for joining and uh for watching this um, another we'll idea have... that i got suddenly and had to do yes i agree and this was a lot of fun and it because it, it allows us to like dive into some of the more uh some of the deeper topics of the books just in a in a yes. fun way so i loved it and also you get to ask questions that you you get to basically be asked questions you want to be asked right yeah like the the, the helpful ones <laughs> exactly yeah i loved All it right. well until right. next time till next time bye see ya <laughs>